to actually start the presentation fully, just a little bit about my background. As Keisha said, um, I have worked in different aspects of nutrition. Uh, truth be told, the hardcore kidney dialysis patient it has not been uh, the type of patient that I've seen regularly. Um, I have dealt with a fair amount of diabetic patients. Um, I've worked at, I work at a gym now, and I've worked in two gyms before, um, dealing with people in sports, uh, people just trying to lose weight in general. Um, so different elements like that. And also, um, I've been involved with fitness, the fitness side of it, uh, personally and somewhat semi-professionally. So my, my angles come in, my, my uh, my knowledge comes from many different angles. I'm also a mom of five. Um, so whereas I may not have a kidney condition, <laughs> I have my own unique set of challenges with food that, you know, come along with raising a big family. So I try to keep the information real. I try to keep it practical. And I like for my presentations to, uh, for everyone to walk away feeling like we've all learned something new um, and, and making better decisions. So. Uh, before I start, can everyone check in in terms of I'd like each I'd like a few of you at least to with one very, very short sentence, how you feel about nutrition and managing kidney disease. One sentence. Anybody I'm given the floor. Anyone at all? They're all quiet today. <laughs> I would like to say something. Um, so recently we had put together just some little hampers um, for some of the patients um, to do with World Kidney Day. And it was very challenging to find food that was appropriate for people who are on hemodialysis because Obviously, it's a, it's a specific diet, mm -hmm. so I found it hard to locally find things that would fit um, that yeah. kind of yeah, especially in a ham in a hamper because a lot of the food you want it prepackaged and not fresh, so that in itself would make it challenging. Um, okay, well, let's nutrition nutrition on a whole is a very complex subject. Um, it's not something that necessarily excites most people, um, even though it is such a key component of how we function on a day-to-day -day basis. And you tend to find that people will really perk up and pay attention to nutrition when they have something go wrong. Um, whether it is, a, it is a kidney condition, whether it is it's another chronic disease, whether it is cancer. Um, we have different processes that happen in our body and we take them for granted and we don't really often question how food makes or breaks us um but definitely with kidney care you know the the, the margin for error is a lot smaller and as i'm sure many of you would have had your own set of experiences um trying to trying to manage what to eat and in your own right you're your own expert you know your body some better than any of us who are, who are yeah. in the healthcare teams you uh, know yeah what this what you so are you talking to me sir oh, oh sorry 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 my body <laughs> sorry <laughs> right so just this uh, first slide is just an introduction in terms of what the dialysis is actually doing. Um, we know that it is it's helping your kidneys to do the functions that it's not performing at its optimum. Um, it's removing waste, salt, and extra water to prevent it from building in the body. And also to helping to keep levels of certain chemicals in the blood, uh, minerals, your potassium, uh, your sodium, which we'll talk about in more detail. And we recognize that there are five stages of a kidney disease development. Um, we don't need to go into the, the nitty gritty of what those stages are, but I put them there to bring to the table that depending on what stage the person is at may depend on the type of uh, interventions that they need. So from a, from a nutrition standpoint, you would have persons such as myself who are nutrition coaches 
but then you also have persons called registered dietitians and that can in itself determine what stage you 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 deal with so you know if somebody needs to have um intravenous nutrition that would not be my remit i could part i would be able to deal with the with a client just before they go into you know a, a moderate a moderate decrease in like a, a stage 3a um, and I may even be able to deal with a little over that, but if the patient really becomes to end stage kidney failure, then that is where a person such as myself would uh, pass the patient to someone else, to a registered dietitian, right? Um, so let's move forward. <clears throat> Why, what are our expectations when you come to see a nutrition coach or a dietitian? Well, the first thing for sure is that you don't, in my experience, you don't want to come to talk to somebody that's lecturing you. You would like it to be, you know, a, a, an open, honest conversation about what your challenges are. Um, when you're dealing with clients, everyone's going to have their own individual goals, depending on where they're at. Um, we were, I was actually talking to Keisha in person just the other day saying that, you know, everybody's challenges are so unique and it can be a real challenge to, um, to, to now don't, when you have, when, when, the, when formulating a meal plan and a fitness plan can feel overwhelming in addition to everything else that you have to deal with, with your medication and what's not, it can be very, very overwhelming. So you, you know, you need to have that type of rapport with your nutritionist to help pull out different aspects of that. Um, <clears throat> and, and your nutritionist <laughs> and anybody else in your team also has to be open to working in an integrated environment. And by that, I mean that, you know, there are things that sometimes the doctor may explain, um, but perhaps you, you may have forgotten to tell your doctor something, but then when you come to the dialysis clinic, you realize you, you, you told the nurse at the dialysis clinic, you would like to have a conversation with everybody involved. If, a, if your dietitian or your nutritionist has made changes to your program, they need to be able to help you relay that back to the doctor. So that the more you have everybody working together, the, the better you are able to achieve your goals. And basically we want to, with, with having our eating on, on, on plan, we want to be able to hopefully decrease your blood pressure or stabilize your blood pressure. We want to be able to decrease your risk of developing type two diabetes. You obviously would want to slow down any progression in kidney damage um, and then management of everything that the kidney does from your blood urea to uh, your uremic levels, to your albumin, everything that is involved with your nutrition, right? Um, this first step with coming to see a nutritionist, I spend quite a bit of time explaining this to clients um, because I find that once you have an understanding when, when I ask for certain things to be completed, if you understand the importance of them, then you know you're a lot likely to be successful in your program. So you know, for instance, there are a lot of people that will put weight gain um, as 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 what they would like to achieve as part of their goals. But then the understanding of what actually makes up weight, be it your fluid, your muscle mass, your fat mass, um, your visceral your visceral mass. You know, a lot of people don't always have a clear understanding of what those different parameters are and the importance of measuring them. Um, in, in, a, in addition to that, you want to look at other aspects of a patient's um, life that impact their food, uh, uh, elements that you may not have thought were that important, but very much are. So a person's sleep patterns, um, their stress levels, their finan finances is a huge one, especially if, if you live in Barbados. I think it's probably the most expensive island in the world. Um, to try to even remotely think about eating healthy sometimes. You wanna look at the person's cooking. Um, somebody that doesn't necessarily really enjoy being in the kitchen might have a different treatment plan to someone that, that's a chef. Um, and then also to incorporating elements of lab tests, which, you know, you would have your lab test at the clinic regularly on a schedule, um, checking out all the different markers, and you need to be able to tie in what you're eating with what those lab tests say. So let's just dig in a little bit in terms of what the kidneys do. Um, 
I'd like a little interaction, if possible. Anybody has any idea what the kidneys do without really studying the slide too, too, <laughs> too much? Oh, uh, Ro is it Rohan? Do you know any of these people, Keish? You can call them out. <laughs> um, the kidneys get rid of me. That's the little bit that I know. Okay. And uh, would you like to repeat that, ma'am? Yeah, I was only saying that um, oh, the little bit that I know um, mm -hmm. is that I know that the kidneys get rid of waste. Right. Yeah. Yes. That's a very big one. Um, yeah. So, yes, that's a very big one. Any Anything else from anybody else? They also control the blood pressure. Absolutely. Through fluid. Absolutely. So what's quite amazing about the kidneys as well is, you know, they, they, they really kind of look like small organs, but they have such a huge function. Um, and as you can see here, we've listed about six or seven. So they're controlling the acid and alkali balance in the body, uh, controlling fluid balance, maintaining your electrolytes, removing waste, controlling blood pressure. They also produce a hormone called erythropoietin and the activation of vitamin D. So as we can see, if any, any of those things go off in the body, you're asking for a lot of trouble. So it's really important that we keep everything uh, in, in tip top shape. <clears throat> uh, then we would have ways of tracking your progress. Um, are any of these markers familiar to any of you? Your blood urea nitrogen, your hemoglobin, iron saturation, albumin, potassium, calcium, phosphorus. Uh, Keisha, these are things that get checked regularly at the clinic. Yes. Um, so I, I want, I put this here just as a reference. I don't think it necessary at this stage. I will make mention of different ones going a little further down, but I want, I have, let me pause and say that I, I have actually put together a full brochure of everything that I'm going through here now. So, I mean, if you want to write notes, you can, but when I finish this, uh, if there, any, there might be some other information that I need to add depending on your questions or your feedback, but I will be sending it to Keisha so that she can email everyone directly. So pretty much everything on the slide and more <laughs> is in the brochure. <laughs> so yeah, so this is, um, this is a table that, you know, if you wanted to print it and put it somewhere close to hand, I love tables. I, I love references that I can look at uh, quickly if it's important information. Um, so if you don't have it already, this is uh, what you can refer to for different markers that get tracked at different times that also help a nutritionist to look at what nutrients could be being affected by, by your condition or by treatment. Now, this is the first, first, first point of reference if you're coming to see a nutrition coach, or, or even if you're not, you're just interested in what you're eating. Um, this is something for sure when I'm dealing with diabetic patients, you cannot come to see me and not have done some form of a food diary. Um, some people they say, oh, you know, it takes so long and I'm busy and whatever, whatever, but inevitably when you've done a food diary, there's so many different things that you may not have paid attention to. Um, may, it might not even be what you're eating, but why you're eating might become more obvious to you when you start writing it down. It might be that you really weren't satisfied with the food that you had for three days on stretch, and that might be something that you weren't paying attention to. Um, it might be that the medication didn't interact so well with a particular meal. But the thing is, is that particularly for certain conditions, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, kidney function, it's even more important that you at least, I would say in the beginning stages of understanding your body, that you do a food diary at least twice a week. And that way too, when you go to any consultation, it might not even be with your nutritionist, it might just be with your, your, your regular doctor, you can still show them what's going on and give them the opportunity to understand what it looks like for you. Um, if you come to see a nutrition coach, I, this, I would pull this out a little further in the sense that what we're really aiming to find out 
um, which I have here on the next slide, you want to look at the overall picture of what's going on for the client. So their total calories, uh, their macronutrients, which I'll, I'll describe in a few minutes. Um, and then you want to like really understand portion sizes, you know, especially, I mean, not even for some people it might be overeating, but for others, it might be they have no appetite and, you know, they just, they think they may be eating enough, but when they really start paying attention through a food diary, they realize, no, you know, this is, this is becoming an issue. So for sure, um, a, a, a nutrition coach or a dietitian needs to be able to work out what your exact calorie needs are um, to make sure that you have enough energy to make sure that you're functioning properly. They need to work that out. And that is going to be very individual. Um, that's going to be dependent on your age. It's going to be dependent on your height, your gender, your activity levels. And yes, you can calculate those things on some very trendy apps now. <laughs> so it's possible to bypass me and that's okay. I don't take it personal. <laughs> but, but that is something that a nutrition coach would definitely have to do to help you formulate a plan that is unique for you. So the first, um, the first thing you want to look at would be your overall calories. As it says here, you need to have energy for sure. Um, outside of kidney care, I found a very interesting uh, experience with a lot of clients that I see who are overweight. Um, and that is basically that a lot of people actually under eat, but they under eat the wrong calories. And that's what, that's what leads to the weight gain. It's not always a situation that people are overeating that is causing the weight gain. And, and something we have to understand, which I'll, I'll touch on in a little deeper detail is quality, quality, some quality most of the time actually tops quantity. Um, so when it comes to body weight, we need to look at stuff like that. Um, now, obviously, too, we need to look at your other nutrients. <clears throat> so macronutrients, that's the, uh, the, big, the big nutrients, if you like. Um, that's your carbohydrates, your proteins, and your fats. Um, now, when people get a consultation for nutrition, um, there's a lot of people come in with their own ideas in terms of how much they should have. There are a lot of fad diets out there that say, oh, this, this, the, the carbs are the bad, the bad villains, the fats are the bad villains. Um, how much of this should I eat? How much of that? And I think that the frustration with nutrition can come into when you're trying to link numbers <laughs> to quantity. <laughs> and you see it all spread out on you in front of a, of a chart, and you're like, what does all of this mean? And I, I do spend some time explaining to clients what the numbers mean, but when you get quantity, uh, the quality, sorry, when you get quality under your belt, the quantities tend to take care of themselves because there's certain foods that because they're healthy and because they're having the fiber, nobody has to hold a gun to your head to tell you don't eat anymore. Your stomach is just going to naturally shut off, right? But I still put some figures there to show you how it can it can uh, vary drastically. So the numbers that are in brackets, so the 20 to 80 percent carbs, 20 to 40 percent protein, 20 to 80 percent fats, it can be a lot of variation with with what that means to, the, to to different people. So you can have ketogenic diets that are very very high fat. Then you can have your low carb with, and high fat. Then you can have very high protein. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a mix and match, but basically uh, when you are, when you're seeing a nutrition counselor, they can look at, they can uh, marry your story in terms of how you feel, um, in terms of what you, the needs of your body are. Uh, somebody who is an elderly person is not going to have the same macronutrient intake as perhaps a very, very active tennis player or squash player. You know, all those, all those different factors can be, um, married together to be able to decide where is the best place for the person to start in terms of the con the macronutrient content of their diet. The next one that is a really, really big, I, I would say the, probably the primary nutrient of concern is protein. And <clears throat> protein, 
Protein is, as it says here, it is one of the most plentiful of nutrients in the human body. Um, you have different types of protein that are categorized into two groups. You have your structural proteins and you have your functional. So the structure is kind of self-explanatory. That would be your hair, your muscles, your nails, your joints, your tendons. And then you have your functional ones, which I, I, feel, I would say most people don't know the detail of the functional ones as, as, as ready, as easily. Um, and those would basically be all your enzymes, your hormones, your neurotransmitters, um, that all, all work together to keep our body functioning properly. And one of the reasons why we need to track protein levels in the blood is because protein also helps to increase something called albumin, and albumin helps the body to heal and fight infection. Now, I had a little chit chat with uh, Keisha about uh, something that we're about to discuss here. And basically, um, sometimes there can be, uh, when it comes to the whole idea of how much protein is too much protein, there can be different schools of thought. Um, in terms of kidney dialysis patients, protein is very important to track for the reasons stated there. And that is, is that research has shown that protein is lost after each treatment. And it, it happens because the protein attaches to the fibers and the filters of the treatment. That is, that is what is understood about what happens with protein. So I found a table here that compared the protein intake of, of non-dialysis patients to patients uh, on dialysis. And according to the CDC, the dialysis patients need just about 50% more protein than the average person, normal person that does not have uh, that condition, right? And what I've done here um, is I've put together combinations, just as you can see as an example, um, because I remember I mentioned earlier about marrying uh, numbers to quantities. So I've just put here a few combinations to show you what amounts to a certain amount of protein. Um, and you know, if, if you were to get a proper meal plan ironed out, these are things that we can work out together. How much is too much? How little is too little, right? So that you can see. And then they have in the, um, in the, I don't know if, in the brochure that I that you will get via email, I actually have visuals of, of each of those portion sizes because I'm, I'm a visual person. Don't show me too many numbers. I want to see pictures. <laughs> so that helps me to, to just understand it a bit better. Okay. So this is the big, big question here with protein. And this happens, this is a question that pops up regardless so whatever nutrition uh, presentation <laughs> I'm having, it's been a question that has been asked from the time nutrition was formed as a subject. Do we eat meat or do we not eat meat? And personally speaking, I, I try to make that decision based on the client that's in front of me. Um, I think that there's so many uh, pros and there's so many cons as well. Um, but I think that the you know, there is a lot of recent research that is gearing towards more plant-based diets um, for very valid reasons. And I think that even if, I always tell clients, even if you don't decide to uh, cut out meat completely, that if you do have persons in your network that are vegan or vegetarian, that a lot of times, biggest issue is that we haven't included enough uh, vegetables in our diet. So you can still learn a lot from exposing yourself to more plant-based diets. And I mean, it's undeniable that there are definitely a lot of benefits that can be gained from them. But in terms of saying that everybody needs to become vegan or vegetarian is not my professional stance on it. But I do know I have met a lot of health professionals who are definitely gearing in that direction. Um, I can put some, there's some resources if you're interested in, in finding out more about a vegetarian lifestyle um, that I can put there for you. Um, but it definitely, you need to, if you made the decision, it needs to be well informed. You're not just saying, oh, I'm not eating meat and I've heard that this is the best thing for kidney function and this bloom, bam, stop like that, right? You need to be very clear on what you're including and what you're excluding and the possible effects of that. What I've put here, um, and I'll go through these, 
uh, are some of the possible benefits. So uh, plant-based proteins are considered low biological value versus animal-based proteins, which means that there's, there's more protein uh, per gram in animal-based. Western diets are largely rich in animal protein, which is acid producing, whilst deficient in fruits and vegetables. That for sure has been shown over and over again. Um, despite their relatively high potassium content, they have not been shown to induce high potassium levels in dialysis patients, whilst reducing the dietary acid load by the alkalizing effect of potassium uh, rich plant foods. Studies have shown the absorption of non-heme iron exceeds the need for adequate levels of iron while avoiding the toxic effects of heme iron. Vitamin D can be obtained with adequate sunlight and supplementation and adequate amounts of DHA and EPA, which are healthy fats, are supplied by consumption of fish um, and alpha linoleic acid in consumption, through the consumption of nuts and seeds. And you only need, uh, in terms of supplementing with B12, the human body can store B12 for up to three years, and you usually just require small amounts via supplementation. So this is what some of the re re research is showing um, that are the benefits for using whole food plant-based diets. But I always recommend individual uh, individuals to look at their own their own uh, tracking tracking their own markers and seeing how their body's responding to certain food. Um, also too, in the brochure, uh, hold on one second, please. Everybody still there with me? Yeah. Yes? Yes, yeah, okay. we, we're still here. Yes, still here. Still <laughs> here. All right, good. Just touching bases. Weird not to see faces and, you know, <laughs> be able to look into everybody's eyes. <laughs> so I was going to say that if uh, persons are interested in finding out more about the sources of plant-based protein, I've also included in the brochure a list of, uh, in the pamphlet, sorry, a list of uh, different vegetarian sources and exactly how much protein you get per serving um, so that you know, you might want to experiment with a few. Okay, moving along. Right, so my favorite part and what made me become a nutritionist, I'm a recovering sugar addict. I have no, <laughs> I hide it, so I do not hide it, sorry. <laughs> this is why I had to learn about nutrition because I tell people if I wasn't a nutrition coach, I'd probably be the best chocolate saleswoman in the world. <laughs> Life and its conundrums. <laughs> but blood sugar is, um, I think it's something that very few of us don't suffer with. <laughs> More people than not that come into come in to do a consultation with me, it's the blood sugar. The blood sugar always gets them, you know, the sweet tooth cravings and just, it, it, there's, it, it's one of the most challenging things to deal with um, when it comes to getting our diets in check. Um, so I feel you, I understand you, and I hear you loud and clear, but we do need to understand what is, what happens in our body. We do need to understand the effects of it, because if we don't get it in check, um, I definitely believe sugar is a hidden drug. I, I don't think that we should pussyfoot around calling it that anymore. It is. And, um, cutting sugar addictions truly has its, it can be very challenging for many people. So basically, once the blood sugar levels get higher than 100 milligrams per deciliter, the kidneys are going to start to spill sugar into the urine. The higher the blood sugar, the more the sugar comes out in the urine, the higher the blood sugar, it, the more it gets attached to, to protein. And that is what we measure when we look at hemoglobin A1C to help give an estimate of the average sugar levels in the blood for the past three months. It is really important. I remember when I first put together um, a nutrition presentation some years ago, and I really started to dig into different names. It's amazing how manufacturers can hide uh, sugar in our food because it comes in all sorts of names, glucose, fructose, molasses, maple syrup, mal malodextrin, sorbitol, cane juice, fruit juice, agave. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So if you don't familiarize yourself with these names, you'd be sometimes you go read a label and you see six, 
six of them, they're all in one go. Not just cane juice, all in one go, you'll see different ones, right? So the more aware you are of it, then the more you can make a, a, an informed decision. Um, and basically I put it the side, I did a TED talk. I don't know if any of you are familiar with TED, um, but I did a TED talk to some school kids a good few years ago. And I decided, you know what, let me wait, let me actually like pour the sugar out so that we can see what it looks like. Because again, just telling most of us numbers doesn't really hammer home. Um, and I guess the scariest one there for sure would be the fizzy pop on the bottom uh, right hand corner. <clears throat> because if you look at the fact that we're recommended no more than 25 grams of added sugar per day, and you get one fizzy pop that has 70, you just, that's it. There's nothing, there's no room for, for any more. And that's, and those recommendations are if our kidneys are functioning well, if they're not functioning well, then that is going to have an even harder time um, coping with that amount of sugar. So that's just the drink. That's not the drink plus the biscuits. That's not the drink plus the fruit. That's not the drink plus the macaroni and the pasta and the rice, which will also convert into sugar. That's just added sugar. So for some of us, we it, it that may actually be the first place that we need to start without even having to consult with a nutritionist, being honest about the sources of sugar in your diet and helping to keep them in track. And one of the things which if 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 any if anyone um right now in the in the presentation, if you are diabetic, um, I'm sure that you would have known this as well too, is that sugar impacts our insulin. And that's one of the major reasons why insulin leads to weight gain, right? Is because anytime you get high insulin levels, it's going to signal to your body to stop burning fat and it becomes a vicious cycle. So we really, really have to monitor our sugar intake. Um, I don't have this on the slide, but I feel compelled to also put in there sugar and in its forms, whether it's chocolates or pastries or cake or ice cream, has a very, it, it, there's a lot of pleasure that's derived in our brain when we have this food. And, you know, it, 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 we often do compensate for it when we're in unhappy spaces. So, you know, if it is that you may find yourself quite depressed dealing with your condition, and one of the first things that you want to turn to is sugar. Um, and that was actually something that was one of my challenges. Um, that hit me one day in the middle of my being upset about something that was going on and realizing that I was determined to get out the door and find some source of, of, of chocolate, right? And it really hit me that day. This is years ago. It really hit me that day. Wow, you know, this is, this is what it's all about. So don't downplay the fact that sugary stuff and high fat foods are very, very closely linked to our mental health and our stress levels. And that's, Oftentimes, why making nutrition uh, decisions can be very difficult because a lot of times people also need to have the support of mental, mental, sorry, I don't even like to say mental because that just has this connotation that people are crazy and it's not. You're, we're normal people that have all sorts of difficult challenges going on. So I say that to say that we need to also include having that support from psychotherapists and psychologists and counselors so that if, if we are serious about making a change in, in the food, we're also looking at the underlying decisions, that the underlying factors that are driving those choices. And sugar for sure is a big, big, big one. Um, I've put a list here of different sources of sugar. Um, basically, I mean, I think it's a given, I think we've seen enough public health messages to know that soft drinks are a no-go really. Um, if I could, if I could have my way in a nutrition world, if there was one food that I just think should be completely banned from Earth, never really to exist, because it doesn't do anything. <laughs> I know others wouldn't be happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Why Keisha is running? should answer that when she gets back to her desk. <laughs> so, Keisha, Keisha, um, who can test to that? I, my Keisha, 
love my love of Coca Cola is legendary. So, but I'm listening to this. I'm going to try. I'm really going to try. <laughs> I, I say that not to say that you know I don't really like telling clients don't ever do something. But I'm speaking strictly from strictly from a nutrition perspective. They really don't offer anything, and um, a little later on, one of the things that will come up with soft drinks is the phosphorus which has its own set of issues, but we'll, we'll cover that. So <laughs> these soft drinks are, are a no-go, and as much as you can, avoid them. Um, I, can, I can also put in a little alternative. Sometimes it's the sugar in the soft drink, but one of the things that I found I was missing that I liked with soft drinks was the fuzz, the fizziness. So I try really hard now, if, if I'm really getting that craving for that, I will use soda. I will use soda water and I, I go into, and my kids now, <laughs> they go in the fridge and they take my drink, which is a mix of soda water and lemon juice. I love soda water and lemon juice, right? That's my go-to because I just, I miss that fizziness a lot. So, you know, there are always alternatives. Um, definitely the bottled drinks, um, any kind of like drinks that have having preservatives. Uh, are usually a no-go as well uh, for reasons because th those can also offset your mineral balance, which we'll touch base on in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> and then when you have juices, it's kind of an obvious one too that we've removed a lot of the fiber. So a lot of it's just sugar that you're absorbing all in one go. So, you know, for as much as possible, you can try to eat the whole fruit without guzzling back too much, too much juice. Um, I put here uh, the artificial sweeteners are also ones that can be quite controversial. Um, the equal and the sweet and lows, I found that they're still quite heavily recommended uh, by doctors here. <laughs> um, but I try to, personally for me, in terms of what I've come across with research, I've, uh, stevia and xylitol are the two uh, sugar replacements that have a better, um, what's the word I'm looking for? In terms of the research showing the effects on the body, they've been shown to have a lot less side effects in the long run, right? Um, but again, everything's still in moderation, uh, regardless to whatever product it is you're using, because the other part, regardless of whether you're using equal or the sweet or the stevia or the xylitol, the other portion, the other part of the equation that doesn't often get acknowledged is that part of changing your sweet tooth is also changing your palate. So even, even if you're using something that's a better artificial sweet, sweetener, you're still, you're still satisfying the craving or the need to taste something sweet. Right, so that in itself might be a, might be what is hindering you from really cutting down on what you need to with with regards to sugar content. <clears throat> All right, how we looking there? How we looking, Keish? Looking good for time? You're right. Everybody still with me? I haven't sent anybody to sleep yet, right? <laughs> no, we haven't gone off to sleep as yet. Okay, good. Any questions before I move before I move on? Any on, on anything that I presented thus far? Any comments? Um, you had just answered my question in terms of the um, animal protein. Mm -hmm. uh, the other types of protein because um, I don't personally I don't eat meat, so I just want to know like if you advocate for one over the other, right? Yeah, so it's, it's a big question for sure. So you you don't you are um you're vegan you're, or vegetarian? I would just say vegetarian. I wouldn't say vegan. Right. Okay. And how how is that? How how long have you been uh, subscribing to that lifestyle? About fifteen years. Ah, that's quite a while. Excellent. And what was your what was your reason for doing that? I just did it with a friend because we were just doing it because we wanted to pass and. I just did it just for doing sick, and then from that right. time I have to touch me. That's the only reason. It really okay. was for health conscious purposes. Right, got you. Understood. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that. Okay, so, yeah. One of the, yeah, one of the <laughs> questions I have. Sorry, somebody, somebody went in. I can hear you. Yeah. 
one question I have. You mentioned that for dialysis patients, that they require 50% more protein than persons who may be not be on dialysis. Right. Right. No, we are always told before we go on dialysis, we want one of the things that we are asked to control is our protein. Mm -hmm. And I think that most dialysis patients also try to control their protein. But I, I personally have never been told that you have to increase it by 50%, you know? All right. Yeah. So I just think well, I can I can double check that for you, but I said I got that information from the CDC. So this is why you know sometimes the sometimes the information can be a little hard to say conclusively. But from from my research, that is what they've said. I guess that information is also dependent on the patient too, because not everybody can process or break down protein the same way. Yeah. Even though you are in stage, it is not because you eat protein, like chicken and fish and stuff like that there, so, and as well as plant-based protein, that your body is gonna process it the same way as my body. So yeah. if you have a situation where your body takes longer to process it or break it down, it would obviously not be a situation where it would be recommended for you to up right. your intake of protein. So I guess that is individual, but I guess they're using it as a generalized basis. Yeah, and that's why it emphasizes the 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 necessity to do the your the markers testing the blood for things that your blood your urea nitrogen and your creatinine so that you can be sh double sure that what any nutritionist or dietitian has said to you matches back with what your blood levels are at. It, it would it would it would quite be an interesting experience for someone like myself to even you know to have these markers tested regularly because I think it would get help you to get to know your body so much more intimately, you know. So that if, if somebody asks you if, why, why did you become vegetarian or vegan, you can say, Well, I looked at my blood markers <laughs> and they clearly state that I'm good better with fish and not so good with pork. <laughs> You know, so you, you can tailor, like really tailor your diet better. Yeah, because even when we usually get our regular monthly breakdown of our blood works, you can see throughout the month, if you were a person that, you know, eat chicken nuggets regularly, you can see that your phosphorus has gone up to a certain yeah. amount. And, you know, so you, you would see where it's increasing throughout that month, what you've been eating or how your diet has fallen apart, depending on if it was at a good stage or not. But you yeah. have to be consistently aware of where your markers are, where you stand. Yeah. So that's a better way to know if your diet is helping you on yeah. your dialysis process. Very, very much so. Very, very much so. And same thing again with your blood sugar levels, you know. I, I've met one too many diabetics that when they just when they just start on, on their medication. Um, and they just start with the with the diaries of what their blood sugar levels are, but they don't write down what the the corresponding food is. And I say to them, but then how do you how do you know that you're getting the best results? What if what if I sit here and I tell you that oats have been shown to be great for diabetics and have all this fiber and everything, but for you in particular, oats may send your blood sugar off. You are you you know what I mean? So if you if you haven't tracked it alongside the actual marker, you just really don't know. All right. Okay, so let's move on to the next nutrient that we also need to track. Um, and that's potassium. Has anyone here um, had any challenges with their potassium levels? I have over a period of time have some up and down issues with my potassium. Um <laughs> But, but in tracking it, I know some of the foods that I've been eating that has caused that. Right. So potassium is a tickly one for sure, and that's because it's found in so many different foods. Um, if we look at what, before we get into the food, so if we look at what potassium actually does, um, we can see here that it helps your nerves and your muscles to contract. It helps to maintain a regular heartbeat. It helps to move nutrients into the cell and products out, and it helps to offset some of the harmful effects of sodium. So again, um, we have another nutrient here that doesn't usually cause an issue, but in kidney patients, it definitely is one that we need to be sure that we know where you're at with it. Um, 
I have here that there, there is a recommendation of 2,000 milligrams per day. Are we in agreement with what you've been told somewhere along that benchmark? Anyone? What about Alan? <laughs> Did you say, you want to unmute it, Alan? No, I, I don't think I've ever been told that, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure how you would go about measuring that. That That is, I think that's... Yes, uh, and that is a very valid point. Of measuring it is a... That is a very valid point. When it comes to measuring any of the minerals, in terms of being able to get the exact quantities the same way how you would with, say, more carbohydrates or proteins, that can be a challenge. And I think that probably one of the most useful ways would be constructing a chart similar to this and actually putting in, which is something that I would do if you came to see me, <laughs> putting in the portion size and the amount of uh, potassium or whichever mineral you're looking at, and then being able to put, pull it down in smaller detail um, in terms of, because it might be, for instance, you have, if we look at what we have here, sources of protein, right? Not protein, sources of potassium. Yes, you're looking at a chart that's full of food, but for you personally, you might only be interested in having, say, lettuce, carrots, and yellow squash. There might be nothing on there that you like. So that, that makes it easier. It's not, it's not trying to figure out the potassium at every single source, but what are the sources for you? And then, you know, then understanding the portion size. So I put these charts in because these are things that you can stick up in the kitchen for an easy reference. And the opposite of that would be sources that are high. And, you know, it's when it comes to high source, things that are high in a particular mineral, I wouldn't say that I would tell a client, don't ever eat it. That would be unrealistic, especially if it's a food that you like, but you would definitely want to be aware that you're not eating it every day or you're not going silly with it in terms of the portion sizes. Awareness is the name of the game here. Um, so this, uh, have any of you received information like this before pertaining to different types of foods? Yeah, I'm pretty sure most of you have, yeah. Um, point of reference is what I put here at the bottom. We energy drinks, even certain types of water, the vitamin mineral drinks, those would be big red flags. It would not be something that I would recommend to just drink. Yeah, certain types of uh, branded water. Yeah, they would have added minerals to it. Um, and then preserve, certain types of meats would have potassium added to it as well. Um, so again, just having an understanding of what those are and sticking as much as possible to, to the foods that are low in potassium. Okay, let's move on. Oh, I put a little, I put two slides here, um, which are not directly, or should I say only related to potassium. Um, but I mentioned earlier that for the most part, the challenge, the challenge can be incorporating vegetables for a lot of people, right? I've met a lot of adults who would not want to admit openly that they don't like vegetables, but you'd be surprised <laughs> that adults can be just as picky as children when it comes to eating vegetables. Um, I find that vegetables can be very weird in terms of texture, depending on cooking method. Um, you know, there's some people, some of us that like them raw and hate putting anything of any kind of dresses on them. There's some people that can only eat, that only like them if they're roasted or cooked, you know, so it's experimenting, experimenting with what can you actually do with the vegetables of your choice. I would say for sure, avoiding when it comes to your salads, salad dressings are probably not going to be your friend. Um, and that is in terms of not just fat content or sugar content, but preservative wise. Uh, for the most part, when I eat my salads, I keep things very simple. I absolutely love lemon juice with a little bit of honey, a little bit of balsamic vinegar, olive oil, and garlic. And that is pretty much my go-to. <laughs> Unless it's some other spectacular homemade dressing that someone's made, I will very, very rarely put any other salad dressings on. Um, lemon juice, even on, on roasted vegetables, is delicious. 
it has a real nice zest. And then you have, yes, people say, okay, well, you know, they taste plain, but a lot of times that's because people don't experiment with herbs. You, you can change up things so much depending on what you put. And, and I find that in Barbadian culture with eating, I, we can uh, we can be quite heavy handed with, when it comes to wanting to season our meats and using a lot, a lot of delish seasoning and all that kind of stuff. But then when it comes to doing our veggies, we hold back. And then we expect that they're gonna taste good. You know, if you see when I put parsley in something, like I am chopping up a big handful of parsley. If I'm adding basil, I am using, I wanna taste basil, not just a sprinkle of it. So use your seasonings without having to use the extra salts and stuff like that, which we'll get to. Same thing with fruits. Um, or for sure with diabetes, um, something that I didn't put in here, but I can add to the brochure would be looking at um, you your glycemic index. Has, has anyone heard of glycemic index when it comes to blood sugar management? Sort of. <laughs> right. So basically, it's looking at uh, glycemic index categorizes food according to how fast sugar is released into the bloodstream. So there are different categories from high to medium to low glycemic index, where the low would obviously be the types of fruit, uh, veg vegetables and fruit mostly, and other, other, sugar, other sugary foods. Um, and again, that's another uh, table that could easily be printed and put somewhere in the kitchen for an easy reference. But I say that to say that fruit, um, fruit is one that we can look to incorporate in different ways. Um, words of caution would come with fruit, for instance, when people do smoothies. Smoothies can get a little crazy if you don't watch it. <laughs> um, Smoothies can easily rack up with sugar. If you're talking about you do your banana and then some people put extra honey. I've gone to smoothie places that will turn on and put in fructose powder. And I have to stop one halfway and be like, no, 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 I don't need that. You know, that's definitely something we'd want to want to make sure we keep our eyes open for. Um, oftentimes you don't need five different fruits, two is sufficient. Uh, some berries and, and another sweeter one like apple or you know, raspberries and a banana, but you don't need to put three and four different kinds. Um, you can freeze them. Uh, for instance, um, frozen grapes are one of my favorite go-tos when it's hot. <laughs> um, you know, I love to do frozen bananas for smoothies as well too. You can also take banana, well, bananas would be the potassium as well. You would need to be careful of, um, but if you were to do them, you can still freeze them and make them into a type of ice cream. Um, and then you, you know, you can do a lot, a lot of different things with your fruit. So getting creative is definitely the name of the game. All right, we are now at sodium. Any questions before I move forward? How many people do we have on so far, Keish? You have 51 people on. Whoa, 51, okay. I'm so quiet. We're listening to you with Raps. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So the next big one, which I think has been a big one from the time nutrition was conceptualized, <laughs> and that's sodium, 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 sodium. We've heard about sodium probably just as much as we hear about sugar. And very similar to what Alan said, tracking your sodium can be so difficult because it is in almost everything. So salt, sodium is what gives a lot of things taste. So that's another common, common complaint you will hear a person say, but if I don't add salt, the food not going to taste good. And again, it's something that your palate has to get accustomed to. Um, for dialysis patients, you definitely want to keep track of the sodium. Definitely, definitely want to keep track of that. As it says here, um, we, the sodium and your potassium are going to be the two electrolytes that help to maintain your acid alkaline balance and also uh, your, your blood pressure. So we don't want to unnecessarily cause um, edema and swelling and fluid weight gain. So this is something that we really, really want to keep on top of, uh, especially knowing that if the kidneys are, have failed completely, they'll be unable to remove sodium. So even, uh, you know, impressing the need for dialysis treatment. 
if we look at the fact that one teaspoon of table salt has 23 milligrams of sodium, then we can see how much harder it is to really keep track of, um, of, of, of what we're eating, right? But some <clears throat> recommendations would be for sure, as I mentioned, uh, reading your food labels. So you wanna be really cautious with things that you can, foods, your pickle foods, um, your cold cut meats, your hams, your hot dogs, sausages, turkey, all these different foods with having very high sodium. Um, soups. Soups are a big, 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 big culprit. Canned soups are a big culprit when it comes to sodium. You, you, you probably would shock yourself if you could wear oh the same way you did with the sugar. The canned soups would make you freeze, man. <laughs> so the, where possible, just doing some fresh soup, you know, a little diced up onion and garlic and puree your stuff without having to buy it out the can would be a good one. A, a much better alternative, should I say. And then um, an error could be thinking that uh, salt substitutes are the way to go. And those might not be either because those can be quite high in potassium. So you really want to take some extra time to read your labels. Make sure that you know what you're ingesting. And we're kind of winding down now. I think we've got three more. We've got phosphorus. And we've got calcium, and I think I've touched on magnesium, and then we're winding down to the end of the presentation. Um, so we're looking at phosphorus now, and uh, basically when, phos when the kidneys work normally, uh, phosphorus works together with calcium to maintain a balance. Um, in the kidneys, the phosphorus would build up, causing hyperphosphatemia. And the way that uh, the patient would know that this could, sorry, not the patient would know, the way that this would manifest in the body would be symptoms such as your muscle aches and pains. Um, you could get easily broken bones if your phosphorus level goes out of whack. And you could also get calcification in the heart, the skin, joints, and blood vessels. And again, similarly, I've put what foods are high in phosphorus. Um, so the chocolate is the big one. <laughs> and then also to, um, I believe I had mentioned the sodas. Oh, the, hold on a second, when did I do this? So, uh, soda, dark colored soda, the phosphoric acid is, I think is the third ingredient on the list. And again, that, that has a big effect on our acid alkali base and can affect our bones. So research has shown that there are people who think that they're getting in a lot of calcium and phosphorus through dairy products, but then when they actually uh, look at it, they're also counteracting that by having a lot of sodas. Um, beans and peas can be quite high in phosphorus as well too. So even though this is where it can be a little tricky, even though the healthy food has in, you know, other stuff that you need, your fiber and what's not, this, it still could be a bit of a middle ground for you if you, for instance, are uh, more vegetarian. So that's why you really want to have these lists of different foods. Um, moving on to calcium. So I put here the reference range of where calcium ideally needs to be, 8.4 to 9.9 .9 milligrams per deciliter. The recommended intake is 2,000 milligrams per day. And as mentioned earlier, the, fitness, the sorry, failed kidneys cannot uh, keep calcium and phosphorus in balance. So these are things that we have to measure. And um, complications with your calcium would include secondary hyperthyroidism and mineral bone density that are difficult to treat. And I put in some sources here so that you can see where you'd be getting a lot of your calcium from. And lastly, we've got magnesium. So magnesium, low levels in chronic disease, in, sorry, in kidney disease patients can occur, um, <clears throat> but we have to also know that magnesium is beneficial to the heart's function, and, and we want to make sure that we track that as well so that we can avoid things like calcification of your blood, of blood vessels. And the uh, damaged kidneys cannot excrete excess magnesium very well. So again, this is something that we keep track of. Um, we have here the foods high in magnesium will be dairy products, kelp, wheat bran, almonds, cashews, and green leafy vegetables. So I do appreciate that when it comes to your minerals in terms of tracking them, 
individually in your diet can be very tricky, but I would say it would make more sense to deal with one at a time in terms of how you're eating. You know, you might choose one week to focus on where you're getting your potassium levels at. You can choose another week to move on your calcium. If you don't have a food diary, you definitely need to start one, um, even if it's just twice, three times a week that you're writing in it so that you can discuss these things with whoever is giving you uh, your medical advice that you can become really, really zeroed in on what you're doing and what you're eating. Now, Keisha specifically asked me to mention about fluid intake, um, which can be an issue on dialysis. Um, I don't want to go so personal to ask if anyone has a direct challenge with this, um, but it would be something that we would need to track. And the recommendations that uh, I have come across is one liter per day of fluid of any sort. Is that what you guys have been told as well too? Right. Yes? Okay. So what um, what would be this what would be a, a nice way to look at it because one liter you know you want to it, it one liter might be not feel like enough for everyone I know for sure for me I can go through one liter quite easily so I think fluid balance would be a challenge for me um, feeling thirsty but then that might also be affected by if it's you know how, how much salt you have in your diet as well however I say that to say that you could break down that amount so that it's you can look at it in different ways. So if you know that you're having, you might have some popsicles, you might have soup or ice cream, you would break it down into different portions. So that's what I've had. I put here at the bottom. You could do four eight ounce cups of liquid of some of whatever kind you're having. You could do two eight ounce cups plus four four ounce cups, or you could break it down differently and do four four ounce cups and eight two ounce cups. Right, so that it, it just feels mentally that you're spreading out that fluid into over the day and you're not bottlenecking it into one part of the day and then getting frustrated that you know you're still thirsty but you don't want to offset your fluid intake. We're breaking it down over the day, and pretty much, um, outside of food, we do want to still touch base on fitness and. I don't know if to say that the food is easier than the fitness or the fitness is easier than the food. I think, um, you know, depending on how you feel for the day, you might not be very motivated to stay fit, um, depending on how well you feel. But in terms of actually getting any fitness, I think the real big key to it is making it something that merges seamlessly with your particular lifestyle. And I think that Sometimes there's the danger of how health and wellness is marketed to us that can be kind of a turn off. And um, by that, I mean, yes, we can acknowledge that research shows that resistance training and lifting weights and what's not, it, it, you know, yes, it is very, very beneficial to build in muscle mass. And with kidney, with kidney clients, we want to make sure that you're maintaining good muscle mass, but it might not be everyone's cup of tea. So there's no point to me trying to force yourself into things that you're not going to keep up or you're not going to be consistent with. If it is that gardening is your thing, then make gardening your thing. Make it something that you're really going to, you know, you, you enjoy it. So make it consistent going, going into your garden to get your, your 15 to 20 minutes of exercise a day. Um, in the lockdown, for instance, with me, I haven't been able to go to work, which is at a gym where I would exercise, but I absolutely love running on the beach. There's nothing that lifts my mood more than going on the beach. It's somewhere that I can go with my family. So I've tried to make that a consistent part of my, of my fitness routine. For some people, it could be dancing with their partner. You know, whatever it is that really floats your boat, you try to get it in at least two or three times a week. Um, the other thing with, with, with exercise that I've, I, I want to say within the last two years, I've seen a lot more emphasis on, but again, going back to mental health, um, where I would know Keisha from primarily is at Surfside, <laughs> Surfside Gym, where I used to work. And, and it, what amazed me oftentimes was seeing people walk through the door I had a long day at work, you know, really not feeling so up for it. And then after they've gotten in their workout, sometimes a completely different person, you know, they walk past. And, and just from that little time in the gym alone, 
they're not ready to go home, have a bath, go to bed and start their day fresh. So I think, yes, the fitness part of it is very, very critical. Um, but I think the, the bigger the bigger question is what what do you generally and genuinely see yourself doing and enjoying? And lastly, last, last, last slide is let's be practical about reaching our goals, you know, what, what's really required to make that happen. Um, being, getting in a good variety, looking at different things that are available to you, coming outside your comfort zone with what you may or may not like. You might not like it the first time you prepare it, but you might find another recipe that might use the ingredients in a different way. Um, don't try to see it too much as that you're giving up something, but rather that you're including new things, right? If you focus on the give up, give up, give up, give up, your brain is just going to hear a bunch of no, 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 no. And that in itself is just going to make anyone feel very depressed and frustrated. Um, or I've missed us. Setting realistic goals. This is a huge one. And this is why talking to your healthcare provider can help you on that process. Because oftentimes where we think we can be, there are a few other steps that have to happen before that. So for instance, you may have as one of your goals that you want to eat uh, fresh, fresh, fresh food every day, but you really have not looked at how easy is it for you to get to the supermarket when you finish a particular time at work, or you may not have all the skill set that you need to make a particular meal. So perhaps you may need to enlist the help of a friend that can show you how to how to prepare certain foods better. Um, you may not even you may not have come to see a nutritionist, so you have no idea what what amongst you're eating, and your body's telling you suppose you need to eat more. You know, and, and your, your body's telling you that you're full and you have no numbers to place to that. So if I just say to you, well, include an extra meal, you're going to say, but Claire, I don't need to. My body, I feel good. I don't want to eat anymore. But your body needed it. That's being realistic. Right. And time frame. How long can you realistically achieve something for? Because if you don't look at the time, you're going to set yourself up for a fall. If, if, if something takes three months to actually change in your body, then three months is it. No matter what you try to do, that's what's required time. Um, <clears throat> keeping it simple. Again, this goes back to uh, looking at, at also when, when you're setting your goals. If you try to hammer off too many things in one go, that will lead to frustration. That will lead to frustration. You pick the lowest hanging fruit. If it is that the soft drinks is the first place you want to start, start with that. If it is that your salt is the biggest issue and you're going to get the biggest bang for your butt with looking at your salt first, start with that. All too often, patients try to get everything done in one go and then end up failing altogether, right? Um, be prepared. Be prepared. This is where the value of putting out your tables and your charts so that you know, for instance, when you're going to the supermarket, you know exactly what it is you're going for. You understand why you're going for it. Um, you know, helping to talking to family members so that you know, okay, this person may be able to help you with one part of the cooking, but not the other. You look in your area. Suppose you're a really busy person at work. It might not be practical for you to prepare your own meals. You might be able to um, enlist the help of somebody to help you do that. You might have somebody in the home that's quite happy to help you with that side. Or if you live on your own, it might be that you have different restaurants that have a couple of meals that are suitable for you. And perhaps the owner of the restaurant might even be willing to have a conversation about how they prepare it for you. So there are always different options. Um, Experiment with substitutes we dealt with, like we mentioned earlier, I, again, in the brochure, I would have some uh, recommendations for foods that you can substitute. And then lastly, just being honest. Um, an example of that really would be, you know, when I, when I ask clients to do food diaries, and the first thing they go is, uh oh, no, it means that I have to eat healthy. <laughs> I <laughs> say, but if you if you if you put what you think that I want to see on the food diary, then I really can't help you because I don't know I don't know what you're really doing, you know. Or you might get you might get a meal plan 
from, from your nutritionist or dietitian. And then after the month that you're trying to implement the meal plan, you really don't enjoy it. And the, the food is not appealing to you. You be honest about that. It's not about, you know, trying to hold back to please anybody. This is your health. And this is, these are decisions that, you know, will help you get where you need to go. You know, be honest about your emotions, uh, how you're feeling on, on, in the progression. I'm sure that you're, there are lots of days that, you know, pe people will have where they just don't feel up to it. And if you're not open and willing to be vulnerable about these things, then it makes all your decisions harder. So, yes, being honest is a, is a really big key to making the steps that you need to. And I think that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I think I've come to the end.